Greetings summoners, Cosmic here, and welcome back to another Battle Spirit Saga video. And today we're going to be talking about sideboarding and what you can expect for the launch events this weekend. Just a day before doors open at Vegas. And of course, our Australian friends living in the future should give us box ratios tonight at like 11 Eastern. I think the time zones work. Whatever it is, we'll have box ratios very soon. But many of you might not be familiar with sideboarding and what that all entails, depending on what your previous card game experiences have been. Of course, things like Magic, it's been a staple, but I do know that uh, Dragon Ball Super does it, where, say, One Piece and Digimon does not. So here are, like, the two relevant, you know, tidbits, as it were, from the uh, Tournament Rules Manual, both the, you know, what is a sideboard, so it's a 10-card selection that you get to access between Game 2 and Game 3, um, and then it's important to note that a deck must be within that 50 to 60 range. So, in theory, right, you could be presenting a 50-card deck, and future you know future topic but future video um, if your opponent's playing mill there's going to be some cases where you go hey cool sideboard all of it comes together and now i have a 60 card deck right so um that is a thing as well but this does have to top out at 60 so that is a very interesting point to see how that's going to shake out with future sets um, and then beyond that of course this is between game two and game three you get to sideboard try to you know figure out what is that key card that's going to help me in this matchup um, but then when you go out of those games, right, you may need to make sure you decide board or you are going to get a um, rules, you know, infraction. I think I think it's a game loss. I probably should double check, but um, I know it's probably a warning at first then a game loss, right? They do escalate over uh, additional warnings that you get. So please make sure you decide board correctly and that the main deck and sideboard do match what you registered at the event. And then uh, again, you can ask the um, head judge or, you know, the judging staff in general, if you need to correct a list, like, you know, if you realize it before the event start and you swap around some numbers or have you, but please, please, please triple check, make sure you have all the right names, all the right quantities, all that stuff. Do not get a deck reg error in the actual event. It feels pretty terrible. I've done it. I know a lot of other magic players have, it happens to all of us at least once, but I promise you it's one of those things that you make that mistake once and I don't think I've made it again in the last 15 years or however long it's been uh, going back to the magic days. So again, that's all the you know high level overview. But then this is now shifting to, you know, what are some good cyborg cards? What are some good cyborg tech? Maybe you haven't had a lot of time to, you know, get ready for the event or just look through all the card pool. And there's a lot of cards to dig through, all things considered. So I went ahead and picked, and these aren't ranked in order or anything. It's just they're split out by color because I was literally just scrolling through Bandai TCG Plus myself and just pulling cards to talk about. Um, but again, depending on what you're playing and depending on what matchups you're expecting, you may or may not even want some of these. And I did leave out some of the more like extremely niche ones like puppet strings and just random stuff out of yellow. And so every card I'm about to talk about, I would expect to see in the top 32, if not top 64, just because it's more like generically good cards, right? So we'll have to see where that all shakes out. But without further ado, let's just get into the card. So first and foremost, Divine Halbred Dragon Arc. Now, this is an interesting card because it's something that we've been seeing a lot of red decks cut. So when is this card good? When is this card bad, right? Because of its floodgate effect for that first ability, neither player's life can be reduced by an attack from a spirit that has 2,000 or fewer BP. This really does save you from those ultra go wide strategies, try to kill you by turn three, turn four, right? Just playing a single copy of these makes your opponent commit more cores to the spirits where now they're literally cutting the number of spirits that they can swing with in half, if not more, depending on if they're playing yellow or something because you have to stack up those cores. Now, mind you, if your opponent doesn't have a 2,000 BP spirit that you can destroy it with arcs level 2 and 3 effect, or if they're just not playing a go-wide strategy, well, this card feels pretty terrible, right? It does practically nothing where a lot of the Nova decks, right, they want to get hit a couple times early, get the extra cores, try to get value off a of Big Bang Energy, and immediately go into a big Nova for value. So... Divine Halberd, Dragon Arc, I think has seen less and less play if we go over all the different like metas as they've been evolving, right? Because as more people play white, this card gets a lot worse, at least if they're playing the Elk variant, right? There are other decks in white where this might be good at, um, but it hasn't been reflective of that. And again, these are very like pocket or bubble metas, so it's really hard to say. But overall, my 100%, if you get nothing else from this video, if you're a red player, please have four of these in your 60 card, again, 50 card main, 10 card sideboard and some amount, it's just a really, really important card, and you're going to kick yourself when you just die to turn three aggro and not have this card to help you stabilize. Kind of in that similar vein, Storm Beast, Emperor, Thunder, Leon. 
This one is really interesting because it is more expensive, um, but it does give you an opportunity where now you're also shutting off when destroyed effects and where Arc says, okay, your opponent just builds up a board over time. If they try to go wide and then you immediately answer with this card, in a lot of matchups, you can just five for one your opponent and that should be enough to catch back up. So again, this is one of those things like if you're in red, it's very easy to have this in your sideboard. It's going to hit a lot of decks, especially against yellow. Um, what's really important here is that the when destroyed effects do not trigger. So something like an air of a tower, or the other smaller units, it's going to feel really bad. Like you're losing a key piece of your strategy. And of course, if that wasn't good enough, just getting the ability to draw more cards going beyond that, right? So you then board wipe your opponent. Now you're trying to like draw extra cards, stabilize. Well, this just gives you an opportunity to have a draw card engine on it as well. Again, this is going to be very meta dependent if we're expecting more hyper aggro low to the ground strategies where then the discussion becomes, okay, are they hitting like that 3000 BP che uh, check that both Ark and Leon care about? Or are they, like I said, on yellow and just going ultra wide, having a bunch of 1k spirits, and then you play Leon and win the game from there, right? So if two very, very important cards out of red that are going to be very anti-aggro, but admittedly are pretty bad in other areas. Up next, we have Burning Force. And I know some people are already playing this as a four of, and I've seen some lists that do two and two. So this is like, yes, I know a lot of people are already playing it, but it's still good to mention in the sake for this video. Anyways, Burning Force is a card that we've seen just spike in popularity over the last couple of weeks due to mainly its Nexus removal. Getting to hit things like Netherworld Depths is really, really important. Hitting your uh, White Elk opponent's uh, city can slow them down so they can't just turbo out an Elk on you. Burning Force really does help quite a lot in a number of matchups and just slowing down the game in general. And then again, going back to the, well, someone might just be playing aggro. Sometimes killing two, th two things with 3,000 or less can just buy you a turn. Maybe not win you the game and catch you back up, but at least can prevent you from just being dead on the spot a lot of time. So... Burning Force, it is a common, but I would not be surprised if this is like a foil that you're really going to want uh, to get your hands on early because it is something that's just going to continue to go up in value, at least until we get the April promo, which then has kind of a different focus point where this can kill all Nexus cards where the promo in April is only four or less. So something to keep in consideration where those two split off, but it's a common. Definitely pick up your foils early. Moving on from there, and purple is a... Uh, Purple's a little bit of a weird color, isn't it? Uh, so when you look at purple overall, right, you would say like, oh, I need to answer X big threat or I need to answer to Y scenario. And truthfully, you have the Dark Bishop and Cursed Dragon combo already in a lot of these purple decks or things like Mordred that can just pop off extra cores. A lot of what purple can be doing is kind of just already there. It's like what purple's main identity is. It's just the yes, they can get swarmed early and there's not anything that's like arc in purple, right? There's you could say like, oh, bloody rain, save you for a turn sort of thing. But that's not really the, the greatest since that's even more narrow. So instead, then shifting the focus to the Grand Underworld Trio Queen Maduke, this is just a a very spicy spirit to have on the board available to you. Blood Curse is a very strong effect, and especially if your opponent is on something like Elk, and if they don't keep it at a lower threshold, right, because they have to burn you, right, it has to go to 6k, well, then suddenly Maduk is now attacking. She is a 6k. Chances are you chipped away enough their board, so they only have 6k or bigger spirits left, and say, hello, Mr. Opponent, I'm going to attack you with this Blood Curse unit. You are either going to lose a life, because I'm going to attack you, or the Blood Curse is going to make you lose a life. Your choice. Um, and I think Maduke in general can help break up some of these board states in that nature. And then also going all the way back to the first curse video that we did, sometimes like just a 6K blocker against like red confront. So you put her to what, five cores? Yeah, I had to remember what the number was really quick. You put her to five cores, just leave her on the board and say, okay, I have a repeatable 6K blocker that's going to kill you uh, if you swing into me. And that's fine in a lot of times too. Now, again, mind you, a card that we're going to talk about later is an answer that a lot of people are playing in main decks now as a one to two of, or again, if you're going to be in white, it's a great sideboard card. So there are other options to get around this, or again, if you just core theft it, right? Um, but that's also another card that's been in a lot of purple decks. Just good core stripping stuff out of what purple wants to be doing is kind of already there in a lot of the purple decks we've seen. But I think Maduke is the one that's, probably either not talked about a lot anymore but still a reasonable choice for your sideboard because of how the meta has shifted and evolved into the slower mid-range style of decks where a 
6k blood curse can just get there right that is just going to be able to you know ping their life away and be good about it and then of course her first effect is also going to help you strip away those cords and you know de-ramp or choke out your opponent's cores as well that could be a surprisingly relevant ability moving on into white as we mentioned so this one's a bit more of a you know cheeky choice and 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 just as it were i had to i feel like i had to mention it right so over the last couple of i think it's really just been the last week in particular but we've seen a rise of elk control and yes with the new ruling with absolute ice shield that because your life total remains the same elk is still going to deal you a damage but the thing that white is very good at is just gumming up the board and making it very difficult to swing through however dual gun mech lord derm dina rest in peace our friend uh because he died in the Lord, by the way, for those who missed at the bottom, uh, he does get to give you some unblockable attackers. And in a white mirror where it's naturally going to be slower, you're going to be building up a board with these uh, reduction symbols, uh, you know, to make this cheaper. I think Derm Dyna can get there. This is going to be something. And admittedly, I was playing one already in my, or did I play two? I think I played two actually in my version of the Elk deck. Uh, and there probably was one from Eggman's uh event i have full disclaimer i didn't get to look at every single list so i apologize but i think this is definitely something that you want to consider as of a at least you know spicy main card or it's just something you bring the sideboard if you're expecting a lot of slower decks now that said i do think this is a quite dead card otherwise in a lot of situations like don't get me wrong unblockable is probably one of the strongest things that you can be doing in set one but for how those decks want to function and how they're already kind of, kind of having this mass board control and things like suppressions and dream bombs and all that, you probably don't need this on top. It's really just for the uh, board breaks out of white because then it doesn't really matter if he's a 10K first effect. He's unblockable, right? It has to be dream bomb or burst at that point. So, um, or bust, burst, <laughs> dream bomb, burst or bust. There we go. There, that, That's uh, the other one. If you have like two unblockable guys, but that said, this is going to be an interesting one to see where it uh, lands at. And also it's just a gorgeous SPR. So it's just uh, something to keep in consideration. And I am very much looking forward to seeing this card in foil this weekend. Moving on to another mecha, the Gun Knight Heavy Barrel uh, for cost two reduction. I do like this guy a lot. So when destroyed, and it's really important note here, this is not a level based effect and what i mean by that is you'll notice right on that text it does not say level one or level two or anything like that just a flat static effect so if your opponent core strips this with let's say curse dragon uh they do the full combo bishop and a curse dra dragon to strip all your cores from all your spirits this guy is still going to trigger and then choose uh any spirit right so uh, the condition is select one of your spirits with when summoned. So a bishop, it could be the cursed dragon. It could be, um, I'm going to blank on all the other ones now, right? But any one of those when summoned spirits. So depending on if you have another bounce spell and you don't want to put the full combo back in their hand, like you bottom deck the cursed dragon, right? Bishop gets smaller, not that impressive. There's a lot of different things that you can do with it, but also with Nova, right? So Nova is saying, hey, I have this gun knight heavy barrel. He's hidden behind a enterprise on the board and if you swing with me i'm not giving you this enterprise i'm giving you this heavy barrel chump block it and then your nova is out of here so it can create some very interesting board states and how your opponent wants to navigate it um, and being 3k against those heavy red and purple decks it's going to be hard for them not to kill it in a lot of cases so i'm very curious to see if this one ends up making uh room in a couple of slots today or just in the future we know that as the game develops we will see a lot more um, when summoned effects happen attached to spirits. So this is a card that could just continue to go up in value as more of these, you know, must play when summoned cards uh, get printed and included in these decks, like an on play, or excuse me, on play slash when summon, right? It would have the uh, reveal top three, put a mecha into your hand or something like that, right? So Gun Knight Heavy Barrel may not be, make the biggest splash this weekend, but would still be good to consider. Uh, Snowflocken is already considered in a lot of these decks. I've seen it in a lot of Cyborg, but it's just a, a solid unit, right? Armor red, so it's going to help you stabilize against like the Nova side of burning your board away. So it does stick on board by himself. And then also really important, yes, it's for four cores. Yes, it's kind of expensive, but it's worth it. Uh, when it blocks, you can bounce a confront or curse back to their hand. So this just gives you a free block against curse all day long because curse can't trigger if it's removed from the field. And then confront too, especially if they're on like Gagano Rex or something. Now you just bounce their Rex and uh, the rest of their board's not that scary sort of thing right? If they have like two Giganos, you can help, help break that up. So really curious to see where this ends up 
um, you know, how many are going to be included inside. That's right. All going to depend on how much curse, so how much purple and how much confront, which is mostly pterosaurs, but no, some of the Nova decks do have a couple confront cards like Seagworm, like the bigger Nova, if he's leveled up off of Seagworm's effect, right? Seagworm's level three will give the Nova confront and things like that. So I think that the uh, curse is probably going to be the most relevant side of this card all weekend, but confront is not to be missed. And I think this is a very strong card for what it wants to be doing, but it is very much a sideboard card. One that's been getting uh, in more and more main decks, right? Uh, Head Ice Made Fula. So at level one, two, and three, your opponent's core, can, uh, your opponent effects cannot remove cores from this spirit or any spirit with a soul core on it. So I want to be very clear on the ruling here as well, because it was finally confirmed in the Discord as of yesterday. Uh, there are some cards that will say either remove or place. So it would be something like uh, core drain versus core theft, for example. There's a slight difference in the wording, and it was uh, previously ruled like it might get around it. But just to absolutely confirm, core theft does not uh you know, kill fool in this case. So the no cores can be stripped from this and the spirit that has a soul core on it. So a lot of times what you're going to end up seeing now is having a fool and enterprise on board. Enterprise is going to have the soul core so it can protect the rest of your board. And even if your opponent has a, you know, dark Bishop, uh, curse dragon combo, you're able to protect your enterprise, which is still going to give you a 12 K block, 12 K double blocker, excuse me, which is going to be pretty relevant against your opponent's board. Now, yes, they could still have some cursed spirits which are going to be uh, a bit annoying they could have another world depths at level two and trigger that to give something uh pseudo curse to still uh threaten killing your enterprise so there's a lot of things that could still happen um or again in some cases you could just do a you put it on the elk right if you know that they're not gonna have like deadly balance or something um and go about it that way but you know that all comes down to what was the board say what does my opponent played and, and all that good stuff so that said uh Fula is definitely something we've seen in main decks already because a lot of people are expecting purple this weekend. But if it's not in your main and you're playing white, absolutely have this in your sideboard. It is just a very, very strong card for what it wants to be doing. But keep in mind, don't get this card deadly balanced away because it can still be deadly balanced and you're going to be very, very sad when you lose one of your key cards. Forest of Steel Leaves. This is basically just the hey, I don't like what red wants to be doing cards. So this is going to protect all your white nexuses from things like Andromeda, things like Burning Force. Um, and really a lot of times what we've seen out of white, it's just good to have something that can stick on board and give you symbol reduction. Um, and then interestingly too is the second part. So when one of your spirits is destroyed by your opponent, select one of their nexuses and return it to their hand. This has been more relevant than I probably care to admit in, in how it's come up in a couple different board states. So that was surprising. So I, I want to make sure that, yes, the, the level one for zero cores is by far the reason why you're sideboarding this because you need to protect your setup against red decks. But don't forget to use that level two. That has been surprisingly good at just bouncing key nexuses at the right point to just, you know, set your opponent turn back a turn or just get them stuck on not being able to now draw cards or what have you. So really curious to see um, how many copies of this end up getting included when people are on like four Andromeda and four Burning Forest, right? You do need to have a burst set, keep in mind, but you know, that's going to keep them off from playing their Andromeda. So if you play an absolute ice shield, it just sits there until it ends the turn and then they can't blow up your Nexus anyway. So very, very strong card for keeping your white Nexus cards alive and something I definitely expect to see more of with set two, with set three, with EX01, right? With the tournament pack promos, as we get more Nexuses in white that are worth protecting, this card really goes up in value. And then Counter Sword. This is, a, all right, this is an interesting one, folks. I gotta, don't get stuck on this card. It is not the end all be all answer to when summon cards you might think it is, especially against Nova. It is very good. Don't get me wrong. It is a very strong thing to watch your opponent go back up to five life, think that they're gonna board wipe you and go, hey, Counter Sword, sorry, buddy, put it back to the top of your deck. They still heal to five. So a lot of times the board states that you want to set up with this card is I need to be aggressive still. I need to have a board state that is still going to pressure my opponent and not just, you know, delay a turn to get Nova back and then still clear my board anyway. So in that case, it's like if you're playing a slower mid-range grindy deck, it's just it still is not that great unless you have them already down to like chaining deadly balance route. But I've really liked this card in yellow a lot of times because you have a go-wide board. You need things to survive against um, a Nova for a turn, and then you can crack back for like five attacks. 
and Counter Sword is that card. So again, I really love this in the yellow decks and just some more aggressive strategies, but it can feel pretty bad to play at times if you're playing like purple or even like a slower red card in the mirror match. But again, definitely know your timing with this card, knowing when you can activate it uh, and get the effect and it can reward you. So again, this is another one of those like must play in the sideboard cards for certain decks in my opinion, but you have to be very careful on when you're using this. Up next, getting into yellow is Heavenblade Dragon Ryut. I love this dude. Uh, he's just, the artwork is gorgeous. And admittedly, this one is a bit more difficult to get to do what you want to do, but it's still a very strong uh, cyborg card and it is a Fabled Beast. So he's drawing us cards as well. Um, so he does two different things here, which is kind of where it then goes back in the flexibility, right? So a lot of the cards that we've talked about up into this point have been a bit more narrow in their focus or at least really good into one or maybe two strategies. But now uh, uh, Ryu really does do two nice things for us. So at level one, two, and three, during either main step, cores will be placed in either player's life are placed onto this spirit instead. So this is a way that if you can protect it, Nova can't go off because they say, I want to heal up to you know five. They have to pick a number. They say, I'm going to heal four, let's say. All four of those cores go to him, and then that's it. That's the effect. So they have to remove this card first if they're trying to heal. And, well, to be fair, a 4K is not that hard to remove, um, and it's a lot for four, uh, for just four cores at 4K as well. But that said, the other part is during your turn, your spirits cannot be returned to your hand or decked by your opponent's effects. This is very, very strong when a lot of people are trying to like make sure that they can dream bomb that last card or counter sword something. As long as it's your turn and you have this boy on board, he's protecting everything. And there's some pretty spicy stuff you can do. So again, this card has been hard for me to like really get on board with. I have a couple copies in my list as well. Um, he, he just keeps going somewhere in the 60. But if we see a lot of white decks in particular that, wanna, that wants to bounce stuff on your turn, He's a really great protection card for us. And again, the foiling is probably going to be absolutely sick, so I want to find a reason to play him, other than I think he's just, in general, kind of good anyways. Moving on from there, we have Exhaust Nexus, which this is just becoming a very key staple, but most importantly, against those hyper, you know, low-to-the-ground aggro decks, a 3,000 board wipe can just kill your opponent instead. It really can. 3,000 is a lot when they're trying to go wide. But also, what's really great about this card is against purple, your opponent is going to play Dark Bishop, which, surprise, is a 4K. He strips all the, the purple cores uh, cards down to one core, and then you get to react with Exhaust Nexus. And who loves playing Nexus cards? Oh, right, purple. So now we're setting up a 4K minimum board wipe against purple when they play their Dark Bishop. So I think that there's going to be a number of players who just get caught by that. Now, seven cores is a lot to play out of yellow to be fair you know i'm used to paying only two for this card or sometimes free thanks Pent penton um but you need to make sure that you're in a state where i can pay these seven cores if i'm setting it as a burst if i'm playing around dark bishop full disclaimer i've definitely gummed that up myself more times than i care to admit where i set this as a burst knowing that's going to be my play get greedy on a turn trying to develop some nexus and stuff like that and then get punished for it anyway so a very hard card to play right but when you do and you find those windows it's probably going to win you the game so exhaust nexus has got to be one of my favorite cards out of all the cards that i've mentioned up to this point um and i promise it's not just because I'm, I'm biased with yellow but i think it just is really that good of a card if you know the timing for it um and again just good insurance against hyper aggro at times as well and then getting into our last and final sideboard card is soap bubble lakeside so this one is primarily for its level two effect. During your attack step, your yellow spirits cannot be blocked by any of your opponent's spirits with when this spirit blocks effects. Really important to note, compared to some of the other cards we've seen on yellow, it doesn't just say two costs. It doesn't just say Fabled Beast. It is just flat out yellow spirits. Um, and this is going to be really great for your white matchup because, spoiler, all their best cards do say uh, when the spirit blocks. Elk, Enterprise, uh, Glass Bear, right? All those cards just naturally have those effects. So it's a way that you hold this card until you're ready to play it. And, and you know, if you can afford it, you technically want to play two of these so you don't get dream bombed and lose on the play, uh, on the spot. And yellow is very good at ramping cores. So you play two of these, put them both to level two, and then you should be safe, uh, you know, from that point about swinging for lethal. So uh, the artwork is just adorable. Like this is one of those cards I really wish we would have got a full art for it just randomly. 
um, at some point in the future. Maybe we will. Who knows? But it's very cute. I love the effect. Um, and again, I think it's something that's going to surprise a lot of people if they're not expecting it or not ready for it. And so with that, we are here at the end, the final moments before the launch events happen worldwide. And I'm excited. I, you know, we just got word that Mike Elliott is also going to be in Vegas. There's rumors that 900 people are registered, which I can't imagine all 900 people show up, but that's a different problem altogether. But I think it's just going to be a great time. And, you know, as someone who's been doing a lot of demos and has mostly been focused on building up the local scene, right? I am personally very excited for like just getting the local stuff going. Cause I know that's going to be like the key driving factor of if Battle Spirit Saga does well is how good the community support is from the players, not so much the store, but like players going to the stores and spreading the word, right? That's going to be the key driving factor in this game's success. And yeah, I think we have what, three early adopter stores uh, and three more stores on top of that that are doing launch events. So yeah, Michigan's looking great, but that's because I've been doing work for the last, oh my God, what has it been? Uh, three... Seven months, eight, uh, I guess six months. We didn't have much news right after the announcement. But yeah, basically, I've been doing a lot of work over the past five to six months uh, for this game and, and could not be any more excited. Just be able to go to locals, talk about the game, play in weekly events, get sweet promos, and, you know, go to regionals. So that said, I of course, huge celebration coming up this weekend is just going to be amazing, amazing meeting everybody and seeing everyone get excited for the launch of a new game. It's a once you know, it really is a once in a lifetime experience in that re in that regard, right? So I'm I'm hoping people have a great time with it and really enjoy that we're all coming together to celebrate Battle Spirit Saga launching, and also they carry some of that excitement back home with them to their local game store. So with that, uh, again tomorrow I will be doing some recording for like a box opening, one of each of the starters and all that stuff. It'll just be you know video vomit <laughs> as soon as I get them all out and uploaded and all that stuff. So if you want to see, you know, hopefully a better picture of what all those products look like opened up, definitely look forward to uh, coming back. Make sure to like and subscribe so you get that notification when it goes up. But otherwise, just hopefully returning back to normal content sometime next week, right? More, more battle series and all that stuff coming forward. So with that, if you're in Vegas, don't hesitate to see, say hi. Really looking forward to meeting everyone. But until then, my friends, stay safe, stay hydrated, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers. <laughs>